um, first thing you should know, Google Slides, when you're in present mode, one of the options you have is to, again, turn the captions on. So you should be able to see, see captions at the bottom of my screen. Sorry, this might be blocking it. Go. Okay. Um, and the slide deck, this is a, the, I'm sure you're familiar with this uh, picture. You've probably seen it before. In this new world of distance learning and everything we're, we are going through right now, I don't think this changes at all one bit. We are still asking students to make meaningful contributions to the world. We're still doing project-based learning, personalized learning, um, and we are still meant to do this for every single student. So um, I feel it's important to emphasize this more than ever because uh, these things that we lean on, they, I think there's, str there's strengths and supports that persist no matter where you are, whether you're physically in the room or in distance learning. Something else that we're talking about when it comes to accessibility is uh, the materials, and especially right now, in, between now and when we start looking at, um, uh, be, in a few weeks beyond this, right now we are in the uh, gather materials and, and share them sort of phase. And as we're gathering materials, this is where I want to spend time talking about, well, the materials that I'm gathering and the materials that I'm going to be showing to students. Um, do they meet the needs of every single student? Uh, traditionally, we have a what typically has happened is that, and I know certainly this is when I was in school, the way we thought about students with disabilities was, well, okay, I'm a, I'm a teacher. I'm going to plan my lesson around uh, like the typical student in my class. And then whatever that does, if it doesn't work for that typical student, then I'm going to differentiate and I'm going to give it to the special ed teacher who might adapt to the material that I created and they'll fix it. Uh, and now the more current mentality is, well, wait a second. What if I planned my the, the educational experience that I'm designing? What if I design that around the student with disability? And oh, by the way, that hits everybody else, too. And that really with all the equity conversations we're having, that is a, it's a different mindset to think about how we could um, get to everybody. And so if you're, if you're with me on that so far, you're like, okay, yeah, what if I plan my lessons around students with disabilities? What if I thought of them first? What, how does that change my instruction? And what tools can I use to really make sure I am meeting everybody's needs? The, the, instead of talking about the, the ambiguous all students, what have I thought about each student? Right. So Loudon, I think, has uh, adopted this philosophy, and it, it has never um, been more apparent in these, uh, you know, except in the, it's never been more apparent oh, except in the last two weeks. Like, it has been even more apparent over the last two weeks that this is the philosophy, as there's this been an, an embracing of all the materials that we're culling together uh, to have accessibility. Uh, meaning everyone can access them on the forefront of every teacher's mind, every supervisor's mind, every staff member's mind. If you were to go to the Continuity of Education website and you were to click on the uh, secondary resources, uh, the digital resources, you're going to see the top of, of elementary, middle, and high, those resources. The very first thing you're going to see is a section about accessibility. And actually, I like the term usability even more. Accessibility paints this picture of disability, people with a disability, which is certainly four, but there are so many other kids or people that don't even have a disability, but they use these tools anyway. It just helps them use the tools better, which is why I like the term usability, and actually that's why it's there on that website. So that is a, a huge, huge that accessibility is like at the forefront of our website. The second thing is, those of you that participated, and I think most of you did, participated in the IFT trainings, uh, one of the slides that was there was all about the accessibility considerations. When you are, okay, I've got this material and I want to, I'm thinking about taking this material and providing it to students, what are some questions I should ask to make sure that I'm getting all of the students? Um, and that th this would work for all of the students. And this is a series of questions you can ask. Um, primarily, the one I'm, I'm not going to drill into all of them, but the, the, the big one, a huge one, that will get a huge swath of kids, is the very first question. If there is text, can it be read aloud by a text-to-speech application? And of course, we're going to look at read and write here in a little bit, which is our, our primary text-to-speech application. When you're thinking about educational materials and you're thinking about how do we make them accessible, there's sort of a continuum that you can go through. And the first step here is, all right, I'm an educator. I'm selecting materials. Are they born accessible? 
Like, can I find materials that are accessible? The, the next thing is, okay, I'm an educator and I want to create materials, sort of like these hyperdocs that we're creating and pulling things in through hyperdocs. Well, okay, I'm creating a material there. Um, I gotta make sure the thing that I'm creating is accessible. Uh, and then there's three other, which is, well, okay, there's this awesome thing and it's just perfect and I can't find another thing that is accessible. Well, I guess it's on me as the educator to make it accessible. So can you convert something that's inaccessible to make it accessible? And then the last two are in the world of talking about students creating materials for others, right, and making meaningful contributions to the world. Well, we want the next generation not to have to play catch up. We don't want them to have to be sitting in a webinar with the accessibility uh, and assistive technology person going, yeah, how do I make these things accessible? We want them growing up thinking, all right, when I'm making this uh, this PowerPoint slide or this Google Slides or whatever whatever it is I'm making as a student, can I can I make it born accessible for anybody who my audience might be participating? And the very last thing is, um, all right, I'm a student and I'm transitioning out from high school and I'm going to be going into the workforce or going to college. And uh oh, I'm no longer protect protected by this special ed law of IDEA. Uh, the world is not really built accessible yet. Um, what can I do when someone presents something to me that is inaccessible? How can I make it accessible? Just to be clear there, that is not the that is not what we're saying. Uh, students need to do in public school. It's on us as educators to do these ones in blue, but there is a little bit of a skill that we want to make sure they leave with. All that to say, what this presentation is all about and what we're really focusing on with this distance learning is these first two. Right now, you're, we're asking people to go out and find materials, right? And you're finding and you're putting, building your hyperdocs. We want to make sure what you're choosing and what you're putting in front of students is accessible. Is everybody with me? Can I get a, yeah, Chris, that's right. We want to do this for all the kids. No one's going to be left out. Equity for all. Is that, are getting cheers and yeses there, um, Michelle, in the, in the chat? Yes, we're getting cheers. I would like you, though, to give a little language to what does accessibility mean? Because there's visual impairment, and that obviously has to do with physical um, adaptations. Mm -hmm. Access for reading teachers is usually the complexity of the text. So can you talk from your specialist viewpoint of what you consider making something accessible involves? Yes, yes, yes I can. So really these are the questions, these questions that I pulled back up on the screen. If you ask yourself these questions, um, the way I think of accessibility really is, uh, and especially in public education, is that tomorrow, now, of course, we're living in different times right now, but just in general, tomorrow, someone could move in from Texas or Alaska or uh, a different country that has, has, a, has a different need uh, that you were anticipating. So you want to design your materials and then design your instruction to make it as universally acceptable as possible so that you don't even know who the kids are, but they're going to come in and it's accessible to them. And so these are a series of questions you can ask to, that, that, that help you with, um, okay, is, are my materials accessible? Now I'm gonna give you some shortcuts here, but to, to answer that question, you just go through, okay, can the text be read out loud? That's gonna get a huge swath of kids. Can it be magnified? Like if it's static and I can't magnify it, many of you I know have worked with students with visual impairments, can the background colors be changed? When audio is played, and really think about that, I mean, uh, we are living now at a time where there is lots of video content and most video content has audio with it, well, if I've got a hearing impairment, how do I how do I hear what people are saying on the videos? Um, we want to make sure that there are captions there. Um, and then, if there's video content, well, what if I'm blind and I can't see that video content? Is there some sort of description of the video? Um, images. Uh, if I if I can't see the image that is plopped into the Google slide or plopped into my Google Doc. Well, will a screen reader, meaning a, a piece of technology that reads stuff aloud, will it say image 6597 or will it say a picture of Chris smiling and waving? You know, we want to have to have text in the background of images that describe what those images are. And then the last thing is can the, whatever materials, imagine I had a physical, difficult, physical difficulties accessing it. I can't physically turn a page. I can't control a mouse. Can I access things by hitting a uh, Really, it's a tab button on my, uh, that's how we test things is, can I tab and enter, tab and enter on my keyboard? 
can I get through everything on the screen by tabbing and entering? Because uh, many kids, and many, uh, not many, but there are kids that access their computers and their technology through switches. Okay. And I don't, I, again, I don't want to go too deep into those because we'll, we as the assistive technology team will help you. And that's, uh, you're going to know those kids. But what I really mean to answer your question about accessibility is that, that whatever you're putting in place would work for any one of those kids. Right? Now, you might be thinking, oh man, how do I do that? Well, don't worry. We have a team of people, the specialized instructional facilitators for assistive technology, who can help you design your ex educational experiences with accessibility and with, um, with uh, flexibility in mind. Uh, the, the, this screen right here is that, and you have special ed teachers that we've been working with for years that can help you do this. So if you're like, okay, I created this thing and I just want to make sure it's accessible or, you know what, I, when, during my lesson planning phase, when I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about how I'm going to make these hyperdocs, um, maybe I pull in one of these people or maybe I pull in my special ed teacher and we design it together. Um, I think, you know, uh, all, you have experiences all across the map. Many of you have worked in schools where you've had this awesome team teacher experience where you're special ed and general ed and you're just melted together and uh, no one even knows who does what. It's just like uh, a handshake and, and, and it's, it's, it's beautiful when that happens. And then there's other people that have not yet to have that experience. And that's what we're, what we're hoping for is even more of those sort of team planning experiences that way. Note, I and the CIFATs and the special ed teachers are not the accessibility police. We're not like, hey, I created this thing. Here, go fix it for me. It's We're here to teach you to make things accessible from the get-go. And that's where we're about to get into these tools. Chris, do you have a quick question before you yeah. go on? Really helpful. Please. So the question is, if you're completely aware that you do not, for example, have students with a visual impairment, can you skip the part of the checklist about, for example, watching a video? Uh, so, so for instance, like if you like captioning, for instance, is that what you right. mean? Or, I think or they're the talking about captioning the video. Yeah. Um, so can you? Sure. But um, here's the here's the numbers about it. Let me give you the background. You'd have to be one hundred percent sure that nobody in your class right now has a visual impairment uh, or um, has a hearing impairment. Um, and especially when it comes to like dyslexia, uh, the numbers are a lot higher than we're finding people are eligible for, which means there might be kids that need it and you don't know they need it. So why not just provide it? And even if you've created something, if you're like putting stuff together now, why not spend the time now so that next year when you're gonna use the same you know video that was awesome, Let's make sure it has captions in it. If you're making stuff right now, let's make it accessible so you don't have to fix it on the back end. That's a, you see my little thing here, technology supports design. I'm all about designing it right the first way, the first time, rather than retrofitting it afterwards and fixing it afterwards. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so how do we do it? How do we get you, you know, checking accessibility? Well, luckily we have some tools that will help you here. And I equate this just to um, when you were in fourth grade, you had a, an editing checklist. Many of you um, remember, you probably still give out editing checklists to your students. You check for spelling, you check for punctuation, you check for grammar. Well, that is like a no brainer for these hyperdocs that we're putting together, right? We wanna make sure all that stuff is right. This, the next thing we put out is, is it accessible, right? Is it accessible from home? And if there's parents that are gonna be helping kids at home, do we know what disabilities they might have? They might need the materials to be accessible. So um, so we're going to ask you to check accessibility before it goes public uh, to the students. And we have tools that will help you do that. Uh, there are three in particular that I want to point you to. The first one is in the HyperDocs, uh, the templates, I'm not going to open it, but there is a HyperDoc uh, tips sheet that helps you think through the lens of universal design. Like, okay, how do I make these HyperDocs universally accessible to everybody? Well, if I if I make every kid do the same thing, all right, everybody has to watch this YouTube video, and then everybody has to answer these questions, and then everybody has to um, respond back the same way, well, that's not universal design. That is sort of old school, traditional, that's what we had to do. Everyone had to read this book, everyone had to take this test, and everyone had to answer these questions. Universal design would tell you, okay, uh, you could watch this video, you could listen to this podcast, you could read this text, 
Um, you could listen to this text. Uh, all of these are different modalities for how you can get to the same content. And then once you've learned the content, how do you express back what you know about the content? Okay, well, um, maybe I make a video, or maybe I write a, an essay, or maybe I write uh, um, two sentences, and maybe I do in a little audio file. Again, you're providing students with options, acceptable options. Think of it, again, in our personalized learn learning uh, world, think of it as playlists, right? But not a playlist where you have to do every single one, you're giving options there. So this HyperDoc uh, tip, tip sheet gives you kind of a guidance on how to be constructing those hyperdocs with that flexibility in mind. The Grackle Suite, which is what I'm about to show you right now, I'm going to bust out of this slide deck and show you, is a way to specifically check for accessibility. So if you were to click on this link, it would take you to a, a tutorials on how to do it, but you're here with me now, so I'm going to show you.